and lift it to him. We give him thanks this morning for his mighty presence. The songs of Zion, the blessings that are flowing and will continue to flow in the word of God. We give you the praises this morning, we give you the thanks. No man can create this atmosphere, O oh Lord. It is by your sovereign grace, and we acknowledge that, and we thank you for it. Pray that you will continue to bless us as I read the gracious words of the gospel. I thank you very much for your grace and leadership in the name of Jesus Christ. I read now <clears throat> from Mark 16 and the 16th. On to the 19th verse we read, the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take the 15th verse of Mark 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. And now I turn to a very familiar scripture, and that is St. John 3 and the 14. Verse and uh, 14, verse, third chapter of John. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy words. You may be seated. It's a blessing to be here this morning and a great blessing to feel the presence of the Lord. Yes, I believe he gave us a wonderful visitation this morning, blessing us with the song and the music. And I must say that I am truly blessed with the special gift that God has given to Brother Farah that only comes by a gift. Yes, that is not something worldly, but really inspired of the Lord. 
Yes, no matter how much, how many times we hear that song, we feel blessed of the Lord. Yes, come again, word of power. I, and I must say that I am truly blessed to stand up and hear able ministers of the gospel. Uh, yes, that is not happening by chance. Yes, so these brothers have done so magnificently you know, in the administration of the gospel in handling all things. Yes, that I cannot help but go through the message as I get it on the, <clears throat> on the streaming and even go out after to see how the Lord has really made these men able ministers of the gospel. I have no fear whenever I leave but I feel blessed to sit down and hear the words of life. Yes, so I want to thank you, precious brothers, you know, who have been ministering, ministering for the past services. I feel so comfortable. God gave them the right words, the right anointing, and gave them the wisdom to handle, you know, the problems. Yes, with wisdom and understanding. Thank you, brothers, and may the Lord bless you. So, <clears throat> I also welcome our precious sisters who went out to see places that I have never seen. Yes, and uh, what interests me is uh, they were looking at the Mayan pyramid. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, although it's a great civilization that went to ruins, and it's a mystery how great a civilization that is in uh, Mexico and part of uh, Central America, and they built a pyramid, I think, it's 250 feet up in the air, but it is called the Step Pyramid. Nowhere they could have touched the pyramids of Egypt. Although that a large pyramid is uh, more in volume than the pyramids of Egypt. I tell you, great civilization, but one thing I noted, uh, they never gave God the glory. They were idol worshipers, and they sacrificed uh, human beings. And nobody knows what became of that civilization that dwindled in a little time. But in my understanding, they did not give God the glory. Never worshipped him. Yes. And they were lovely people, sort of a Chinese-looking Spanish people. It could teach me a lesson, glorify God in all things. Whatever he blesses you with, he's able to take it away. We've got to bless God, no matter what knowledge you get in this world and what you achieve. Yes, sir. At all the great pharaohs, the kingdom is under the ground 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. Because they worship the great idol called Ra. Yes, and never give God the glory. The only time to give God glory is when Joseph was there. Yes, I thank God for these sisters, lovely sisters. Yes, I thank God for each one. Now, this message this morning is for the whole world. It's for everybody in the world. It's for your family. And it should live on amongst your children, amongst your family, amongst your neighbors, amongst your friends. Yes. And it is open to the public. So it may sound very simple as uh, I read the scripture. Everybody is familiar with that who 
you know, are Christians. And Brother Bruce, what are you going to say about that? Nothing more than what you have heard, but I'm just obeying the Lord. So, I was not going to give you this little something. I did not want to feel that I am a show-off. Nor did I want, <clears throat> you know, anybody to think that uh, Brother Bruce is hearing from the Lord. He only lets me hear when he pleases. No ways that I could make God speak. Yeah. But I <clears throat> feel that this will edify somebody of this little experience. Now, I was not feeling to preach. There are some times that a minister come to the place where he don't feel to preach. But then... I listened to the brothers preaching and thought, well, I think I need to fill in. And uh, I was searching for a message for the communion. So I wrote this and I wrote that. Things are coming, but they just don't uh, register. You ministers know that. And you could make five, six, ten messages, but they don't register by the witnessing of the Spirit that that's the one. So I know enough for decades when that is happening, put down your notes and wait on the Lord. So I waited on the Lord. I said, no, that message don't look like it. This message don't look like it. But I kept the notes. I say, if the Lord leads, then I would, you know, take one of those messages. So, <clears throat> you know, a minister going up in the heights and preaching, there is a great danger. And that is he feels he should keep up in the heights there and always bring something to chill the people. I have never practiced that. Never practiced that in all my Christian life and preaching. I never wanted to choose a message just to stir the people. That's the danger. Yes, you put whatever you have there, Theophanes, sisters, and whatever, you leave it there until the Lord leaves. And <clears throat> still waiting on the Lord for this morning, on a Friday morning, as I awoke, I was between sleep and awake, and the Lord, by inspiration, I will call it, I did not hear a voice. And uh, <clears throat> that message come to me, the simplest message in the Bible. And something inspired me, this is the message for Sunday morning. Is what you hear me reading. So I twist. I told I got fully awake. And then my mind started to go through the word saved. Yes. A person being saved. How to be saved from hell? I lay down there. And uh, I say, Lord, that's the simple message that you want me to preach. And I felt the anointing of the Lord, the inspiration still there. And uh, then I whispered, uh, I say, I will obey. 
no matter how simple this message is, I will obey you. Yes. I turned around. It was so vivid in my mind, I did not have to, to mark it down. Because I preached that all my life. And it is the most simple message in the Bible. But then I felt like uh, inspiration come upon me. All other messages made no sense. I could not go back to none of the notes. So I know that God spoke. Yeah, amen. And amen. I promised him. I'll say, yes, Lord, no matter how simple this message is, it must be for somebody. Yeah. It may go out and win a soul. Yes. It may be somebody that think that they are saved and not saved and have never exercised themselves in this most, most basic, basic message in the scripture. So I am here in obedience and when I obey that, I tell you, a uh, certain blessing come upon me. Yes, and I waited on the Lord, and it struck my heart. Yes, when I really look into the scripture. And then the next morning, Saturday morning, I gave a minister instructions what to preach, what message to preach in a certain situation. And the Holy Spirit come back in the same way while I just awake. Yes. And the Lord, <clears throat> again by the same inspiration, inspiration, no voice, say, tell that brother so and so that when he preach that chastening message, then show them a way out of their sin. And then I remember the statement of the man of God. He said, never preach a man into a place where you cannot get him out. Don't matter how wrong he is there. Don't matter how hard you preach and how low you bring that man. He said, never preach him into a place where you cannot get him out. When he say, I repent. I surrender. You must always leave a room to get him out. And I remember that same statement, the same time the Lord brought it to my mind. And that brother was so obedient. He said, it will be done, Brother Bruce. Yes, it edified him greatly. So, <clears throat> I'm here this morning. And I want to let the children, get your children to understand this message. They may not be of the age of to understand certain things. You bring them to church. And uh, you think that they are Christians and they understand. But many of them are not up to that age. You talk to them and they sound so simple, so humble they don't understand. It make me wonder about their soul. And then the grace of God takes care of it. When you look back and you see them cross five years, six years, seven years, some of them still don't understand. And they ask questions. Yes, sir. 
And uh, you wonder about their soul salvation. Yes. Then you cannot want the rapture tomorrow. No, you cannot want the rapture tomorrow. This is my child here. My grandchild. And I don't know if the rapture take place. If they will go. Because I cannot see the understanding. So we all have to trust God. And many of us believe that our children are going. And we ought to continue to believe that. That our children are going. What about this little baby that are now born? Yesterday two of them uh, were born. Send me the little picture from the States. Uh, yes. And uh, <clears throat> it makes you wonder of the innocence of the children sitting here. So well behaved. They sit in those seats, not understanding. They may catch one word or two words or three words. Yes, and I see that innocence yesterday. Uh, yes, Daniel is filling up some lands here. So I had my grandson, Benjamin. So he wants to take a ride and walk. He died when I came out. Yes, and then the next one run across, little tiny mite, and then it have a second one, she is a chatterbox. So they were picking up mangoes and running, I said, don't go over there, you will fall over into the river. So I was protecting them, and I seen the innocency of a child, five years of age, and four years of age, going to school, and they peep over, and they say, Daddy, Papa, I'm seeing Cedrus. I said, no, boy, that is not serious. He said, Papa, I see the house right across here, right down the hollow. I said, no, son, that is not the house in Cedrus. Yes, my next little one say, I see the beach. And I like to bathe on the beach. Yes. I can convince them. I said, okay, see dress on the beach. Yeah. Went back and looked again. And I said, Papa, I seen my house. He said, you seen it this time, he's seen the paint. And the beach, far as they understand, and is right there. And sea dress is right there. I say, you have to go down far, 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 far down that way, boy, to meet sea dress. Went back again and looked. No, Papa, is sea dress. And the beach is right over, and I have the little girl backing him up, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Then at last, he alone went and looked across. He said, Papa, is not the beach. Is not citrus. You see, what I seen is my house. His house is this way. He's seen his house. Following the paint, I only said that to express the innocency of a child. And brother, it only take God to nourish that child. You know, in his mind to come up to the saving power of Jesus Christ. But in all of their innocency, I noticed something. And that is when I talk to them about Jesus, they have a childlike faith. A childlike faith with all the innocency of this world. Yes, and uh, I say, Jesus love you. And they will get excited. And they say, Jesus love me, Papa. I say, yes, Jesus love you, son. And what about me, Papa, the girls, and the little one, Jesus love you. Yes, Papa, he love me. Yeah, but I want to see Jesus. 
I say, you cannot see him right now. I say, he's here, but you cannot see him right now. I'm trying to cut things down to children's size. And you would surprise to know that in this world, you're talking to an old man. 100 years of age, 90 years of age. And he acts like that child. When you tell him about Jesus loves him, he cannot comprehend. He have never experienced the grace of God. He never heard of Jesus. And if he ever heard of Jesus, he never took it seriously. And the Bible says, except a man humble himself and become as a little child, he shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And that old man, adults, people who have never been exposed to the gospel is like that little child when they could repent. Yes. And when they repent and continue to hear that Jesus loved them and Jesus could forgive you for your sins, they get a hold of it, not by their intellectual understanding, but the grace of God to make that old man understand that Christ died for his sin. Because they are accustomed that if you sin, you must pay the price. You do something wrong, the police will take you up. And the magistrate will have no mercy. Yeah. So, beloved, this gospel is like that. The message that you will hear for a short time and then Jack will follow me is the most basic message in the Bible. And yet, the greatest message that a human being can hear. And the most beneficial message sent by God And it is so simple. Go into all the world. All the world is for everybody in the world. Everybody. This little message is for everybody. I want you children to listen this morning. I want you big people to listen. God has some reason of sending this little message before the theophanies. And before all those other messages that we could preach. Not because you never heard it. But this is an obedience to God. Uh, that he knows what he is doing more than me. I could say that the people heard that message for many years. And they say, Lord, I want to preach on the Theophanies. No, I have not learned to Christ that way. You've got to have the ABCs. You ever hear what is the ABC? Always believe Christ. That's the ABC of the gospel. Always believe Christ. Yes, my beloved. It's a most basic message. And hear this. Preached by the greatest of all human beings. The most basic message, the most simple message, the most common message. A message that had been preached more than any other message for 2,000 years. And to think that my Lord Jesus came down so humble that he preached the message and told his apostles 
to go and preach that message. It's a blunt message. You're talking about a blunt message, direct message, shortest message. And that is in Mark 16, 15 to 19. Go into all the world. Don't just hide it in a corner. It's just not for Israel. It is unto the whole world. All the Gentiles. All the sinners. All the mankind. The drunkards. The harlot. The murderer. Oh God. The jailer, the prostitute, the Hindu, the Muslim, the heathens, not one of them is exempt. He say every creature. Outside of the human being will hear the gospel. Don't ask me to explain too much. But the Branham preached the gospel to a possum, a manicou. And when they question him, he, says, he said, it is to every creature. We just read it here. He says, it's to every creature. I can't explain it. Because I never preached to the horses and the dogs and whatever. But the gospel is unto them also. Basic. I never envisioned it that way. It's after I reconsidered what God asked me to preach. Then I start examining I say, but wait, this is the most simple message in the Bible. And I will tell you something, the most shortest. It presented the gospel in a short manner. It presented to you heaven or hell, life or death. You want it or you don't want it. My God. And if you want it, you're going to live forever. And if you don't want it, you're going down to hell and the lake of fire. Yeah. Such a loving Jesus, sending such a message into all the world, unto all creatures, all mankind. I say, but Lord, this is the greatest message, not the most simple. Not the lowest of the gospel. It is with value. Yes. And to think of it, that you, the greatest person, God and man, God and Christ, preach the most simple message. And that message was preached throughout the seven church age. And the prophet of God went around the world preaching the simplicity of the gospel before he get into all those other doctrines. When he preached to the Africans, when he preached to the Indians, he said sometime he had 25 interpreters. He said he will say, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and 25 interpreters will interpret that. And he had enough time to take a glass of water and drink it. And all that he was preaching was salvation to the nations. They could not understand the church age. They could not understand the other mysteries of the Bible. And after he finished evangelizing, then he came and started to preach doctrine when he was thrown out of Africa and India 
by the churches. And in 1960 to 65 is when he put in the deeper doctrine and the opening of the seals. But he did the work of an evangelist. And while he did, uh, then <clears throat> the people were saved. That is all they could have understood. That there was no other God but the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ, the Savior. So it's the greatest message. And it goes with the greatest simplicity that every human being should understand. And it was sent by the greatest, and that is Jesus Christ, the Savior. The Savior was sending this message to save the people. So this is our message today. How to be saved from hell. In that little message sent by our Lord through the apostles and preachers, it carry a direct message. And the message was very short. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, children. Give me your air this morning. Across the world, give Brother Bruce your air. God sent a message to you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. All right? What is the gospel? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What is the gospel, my children, my uh, little ones? The gospel is that you are a bad boy and a bad girl. That's the gospel. That you're a bad boy and a bad girl. The liar. Passes the wind blowing, you're lying. You were born that way. You steal. You say the wrong words. You are rebellious to your mother and father. You have a temper that wants to kill. Never seen that? No. And uh, Jesus is sending a message for you that although you are that way, he want to carry you to heaven. And he want to forgive you for doing those bad things. That's the gospel he send. All right. And all that you have to do is to believe that Jesus loves you. And he wants to save you from going to hell. That's the next side of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus wants to forgive you for nothing. Without licks. Without scolding. Without anything. Without money. He wants you not to go to hell. Now, what he wants us to, to save, he wants us to save something down in you. And that is called the soul. The soul is just like you. And that soul living in your heart, right here is your heart. And the soul is living in the heart. It has feet like you, hands like you, head like you, and it's pretty like you. So you are two persons, 
You are one on the outside, and you are a next person on the inside. When this body dies, the soul still lives on. And there's only two places, one out of two places, that your soul could go. And that is to a burning fire if you don't accept this forgiveness and serve the Lord Jesus. And if you accept the Lord, then the Lord will forgive you for all your sins and he will carry you into a certain place to never die. But to live with your mother, live with your father, live with your brothers, live with your sisters in happiness. Your mother would not have to scold you one day. Your father would not have to hit you with a belt one day. Uh, no. And the teacher would not have to hit you with a belt. You would not have to go to school and be subject because Jesus loves you. And if you refuse to say, I believe, and I want to serve Jesus, and I want to be a good boy and a good girl, he is going to become angry with you. And when he gets angry with you, he is going to throw you in a great big fire like the sea. And you will burn there every day, every week, every month. You will grow. Yes, you will be in that fire burning and burning and burning for millions of years. No matter how much you cry, no matter how much you scream, no matter how much you say you believe in Jesus and you want to come out of there, there is no coming out of there. Because you say, I don't like Jesus, I don't believe in Jesus, and I belong to a Hindu religion, and I belong to a Muslim religion, and I belong to all the religions, and my religions is better than Jesus. You would not be able to come out. Now, if that applies to a child that come to the age of accountability, Woe be on to an adult. Woe be on to a big woman and a big man. And let me say something about the age of accountability. The Lord revealed that to me strongly, thinking of it. The age of accountability, we only guess it might be about seven, six years or so. But the Bible has no specification of an age limit. The Lord revealed to me that when a child has the sense to accept the gospel or reject the gospel and know what he is doing, that's the age of accountability. And some children could do that at seven and some of children could be foolish until 10 years. They could be foolish until eight years and don't know what you are telling them. Yes, that innocency was proven yesterday when my grandchildren showing me cedras across the river 200 feet away from here. Now God cannot be so cruel-minded to say you sat in church at the age of five and you could have read and write. Therefore, you knew what was being preached. Uh, no. When you have the sense to know what is being said and you don't want Jesus because of the things of the world, friend, you are guilty. And you had the sense to know what the preacher was saying like this morning. 
and saying, accept Jesus, believe in him, and you don't have to go to that place. And you know that, positively know that, and you say, no. I like my plane more, and I like, you know, my friends more. Now, that's the age of accountability. What about a dumb syndrome child? What about a deaf man that cannot hear? I preached to a deaf man at the bridge when I was about 21. And then after I finished preach, the man was looking at me. And then after he do me like that, I cannot hear. God must have some way to indicate the gospel to that man. I was a man about 50 or 60 years of age. Oh, I was desperately looking for a soul. And he was listening very attentively, but not hearing me. And there are people, big people, that sit down, my brother, and listen attentively. But the ears are hard of hearing. And the eyes, they are closed. And it takes a conversion that they may see and that they may hear what the Lord is saying to them. So that's the age of accountability. Not six, not seven. Some children could be so foolish at the age of eight, nine, ten that they don't understand some of them have a learning disability. What about that? Yeah. Some children born with certain problems from parentage, the kind of father, the kind of mother that they came from, the family tree, that they don't comprehend things as they ought to comprehend. God has provided a way for them. No, <laughs> God is a gracious God. Yes, my children, I was talking to you. When I cut it down to children's size, then I meet the old man. Yes. This is the smallest I could cut it down to. And then I catch the middle age, I catch the teenager. Yeah, you can tell me you did not understand. To an old man, right down 90 years of age, I'll tell you something with a child. And that same childlike faith God expects from a big man. Except a man humble himself and become as a little child, he shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And when God sent the gospel out, he expects every human being that hear the gospel to humble their heart, to humble their soul, and say, yes, I believe. Never know. I deal with little children, and I've seen that childlike faith Yes. I said, do you believe Jesus, son? Yes, Papa. Do you believe he loved you? Yes, Papa. Yes. And you want to serve him? You want to live for him? Yes, Papa. Papa, I want to get baptized. Oh, my I am so blessed with a childlike faith. I say, you know, Jesus loved you. Yes, Papa, Jesus loved me. Little girl. I want to baptize. Prophet of God says, don't matter how small they are, and they will confess Christ, baptize them. Now they spread a rumor throughout the world that better believe in infant baptism. 
We are dumb fella. Aye, they try to put us in the Catholic Church. We do not believe in infant baptism, but don't be a blind man. Search the scriptures. Search the message, for in them you think you have eternal life. And the prophet of God said, don't matter how small they are, and they confess Christ, baptize them. Yeah, yeah we don't baptize little children that don't know Jesus. No, not at all. I preach the gospel. Now that's the faith that you must have, like a child. Jesus said that, except a man humble himself and become like a little child. There is no way for you to enter the kingdom of God. And here this little child, You believe Jesus loved you? Yes. Papa, pray for me that Jesus heal me. I feel sicky. I lay my hands upon him. I say, Jesus heal you. A couple of days after, Papa, Jesus heal me. They give no credit to the tablet, no the herbs, no the medicine. Jesus healed me. Now that is a childlike faith. Jesus, by his command, was sending a message to the whole world that I died on the cross to forgive you for all your sins. Would you believe it? A big man has to come down like a little child. No, he is not five, he's a hundred. And be happy about that good news. The gospel is good news. And with his mental understanding, that's not a revelation. With his mental understanding, his reason, his good sense, intellectually, you're going to be saved. It's not a revelation yet. And that old man, I led some 90 years and more to the Lord. And uh, I preached the gospel to them. I said, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Now, it doesn't matter what sins you committed in this life. At this age here, God could forgive you for your sins. Is it true? True, son? I said, yes, it's true. Now, what, what to do to be saved? How to be saved? I say, first of all, you have to realize that there was nothing good that you could do to save you. Nothing good. This saving is from the Savior. He's the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And the only way you will get saved is to believe the Savior. He was sent to save you. But what about my other gods? I am a Hindu. I am Muslim. I am a Catholic. I am a Baptist. I say, we are not talking about your other gods. I am presenting to you the Savior. One out of all of them is the Savior. Only one savior you have out of all of them. So I have to forsake my Hindu religion and this. I said, no. You don't have to do that. You were born, you will grow up. Yeah. And you are bewitched by that. I won't tell the man that. You're bewitched. 
but I am presenting to you the Savior. One Savior out of all the gods and lords of the world. And that is Jesus Christ. So I could accept Jesus as Savior and still hold on to my religion. I say, we are talking about the Savior. You want to be saved, accept the Savior. And you'll be saved. Okay then, what to do? I say, okay, I'll pray for you. Jesus, this man wants to accept you. Please accept him. And by your grace and by through your blood, forgive him for all his sins. In time, the Holy Spirit will come upon that man. Jesus will accept him. And if he lived long enough, he'll realize that all them other gods are not gods. For his own self. Though I tell him he cannot comprehend that. Why trouble the man for it? Why even speak the man religion? Why even speak the gods that he believe in? From a child, the Holy Spirit will reveal that to him if he is saved. People narrow down the gospel to criticize in a man's religion. You know how many people were saved right in this tabernacle? Well, I tell the preachers, don't bother them with their gods. They will pray to Jesus some, and they will pray to Ram on the other side. After a while, they drop off that, because Jesus is more beneficial. The salvation is a supernatural. You can save a man, brother. Oh, no, no, no. It takes God. Look at the people that Brother Branham led to the Lord. Two point something million people. 30,000 blanket natives in Africa. He did not have time to teach them this and teach them that. All that he did was make them accept Jesus Christ who healed the man. You believe in that God? His name is Jesus Christ. You want to accept him? Amen. The service is dismissed. I commit them into the hand of God. He said, who don't come now will come by the third pull. The third pull will catch them again. But let me say this vital statement. Uh, Accepting the Lord and being saved starts your salvation. Every one of you that got baptized, brothers and sisters, and every child, although they don't know all the gospel, it starts their salvation rolling. All right, children, you understand what I'm saying? Now, many teenagers, many big people never took the gospel from the basic foundation. You've got to take it from the basic foundation. And that is, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and I am willing to live for him. I will strive to live above sin. So God help me. You are saved. You are saved. Those 30 blanket natives, 30,000 blanket natives, those who accepted that truly from their heart, they were saved. All right, those people that truly accept the gospel when the evangelist pass and they put up their hand and say, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, they are saved. 
there are higher heights and deeper depths of salvation. And that is where most of you started from. You started off in some church or some group or some independent. The gospel was preached unto you and you say, yes, sir. I accept the gospel. Many of us, when we accepted the gospel and before we get baptized, we was afraid if we could live that life. If you could leave that kind of immoral life. If you could stop drinking rum. Yeah. If you could stop the sports. If you could do this. And if you could do that. Many of us came from that background. You came in with a certain fear. Now but here. This salvation is an act of faith and then that act of faith and grace goes together grace is a favor from God that you never work for that you don't get by good behavior grace is a favor you get from God free 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 so Ephesians 2 and 8 says, by grace are we saved. You see where it comes, children? God chose to save you for nothing. Not upon your good behavior. That is why I don't believe in parents telling their children that when they make a mistake, they start frightening them you're going to go to hell and burn up. Come on. That is not a good measure of discipline. You're preaching doubt to that child. And this child cannot stop his naughty ways. And you keep reminding that child that he is going to hell. Every time he makes a mistake, he's, the devil saw that in his mind. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. Stop it, brethren. Stop it. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Yes. Tell the child to ask Jesus to forgive you. Yes. And make you a better boy and make you a better girl. Yes. I never told, tell my children they're going to hell. What kind of a foolishness is that? You know what some of them tell me? They say, I'm going to hell. I say, why are you going to hell? They say, because I am a bad boy. And my mother told me that. My father told me that. No, you ain't going to hell, child. You're not going to hell. Ask Jesus to help you not to do it again. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Sometimes I take them and I pray for them, Lord, forgive this child. Don't let him go to hell. God, don't dump anybody in hell like that, people. God is not willing that any should perish, but where all should come on to repentance. God, don't dump anybody in hell just like that. No, it it is harder to go to hell than to heaven. Tell them that, Brother Bruce said that. It is harder to go to hell than to heaven. And this gospel right here that I'm preaching, Mark 16, 15, and 16, shows you right there that you have a choice. You make the choice to go to heaven or hell. Not God. For God so loved the world yes. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Yes. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. 
little fella, you could be saved. Don't matter what naughty thing you do, God could change you. The first thing, the first thing is not change the party. The first thing is to put the gospel to the party and let them accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And the evil things will go, Brother Chandler. <laughs> the evil things will go. Old Pentecostal preacher, man. We preach down the place. Jesus saves. Don't matter which prostitute. It doesn't matter who it is. How bad you are. What rum drinker. Jesus saves. That's the Pentecostal faith. Uh, yes, sir. And that rum drinker will hear that. So I want to accept Jesus as my savior, son. Bow your head, close your eyes. Accept the Lord, he stopped drinking rum. That's the saving power of Jesus Christ. That's the grace that I know. That's the savior that I know. That's the gospel that I know. I'm a grace believer. Yes, because I was involved. That when I heard Jesus was saving sinners, I lifted my hand. Yes, and say, I want to be saved. And it worked. I'm telling you, it worked. Did it work for some of you? Yes. Come, let me see your hand, man. Tell the world. Tell the world that Jesus saved you. Yes. Uh, yes. How to be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The other parts of the gospel. I'm not preaching about that. God tell me, go preach. <coughs> he must be saved. The Son of God save you. How to be saved? Uh, yes, sir. I don't care who you are this morning, man. I don't think about your sins. I don't think of how impossible. And the apostles and the acts one time, they got scared whenever the Lord preached a certain gospel. And they said, who then shall be saved? Oh, Lord. What is impossible with men is Possible with God. Oh God, most of us was unsavable. In our lifestyle, we was unsavable. In our eyesight, we were lost. There was no hope for us. We were bound by alcohol, bound by marijuana, bound by cocaine, bound by immorality. Oh God, we made up our minds to go to hell too. And the Lord came around, he said, not so. <laughs> I'm still on the throne. Uh, yes. By grace, are we saved the true faith? True faith. I said, true faith. Uh, yes. No matter how impossible it looked to save me and bring me to a church and bring you to a church, Right? Or our Lord say, believe beyond the impossibility. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believed it, in other words, believe that I died on the cross to forgive him for all his sins. Uh, yes, and is baptized, shall be saved. So my little friends that are baptized in Christian baptism, you are saved. Don't go and keep doubting and doubting because some parent tell you you're going to hell because you just do that, forget that. Stop that stupidness. Yeah. Jesus said, believe and they are saved. If your children <clears throat> die today or die tomorrow and they were doing a little wrong thing here and there. That's their nature. But what saved the child is believing in the Lord Jesus. Not how good the child is after baptism. Uh, no, 
that does not bring salvation. He believed in the Lord Jesus. The little tender heart with childlike faith believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Come out of the fool, drop down and die, the child is saved. The little boy is saved. Yes. Saved, that is one, one phase of it. Saved. You tell your child they're going to hell, check back yourself and see how many mistakes you made. Huh? And let me say you're going to hell. You will see the depression you're going in. Some children's minds are fed with foolish parents telling them, you're going to hell. You see, you, you are the worst child I have. You are a hypocrite. You should not be baptized. You are preaching another gospel than Jesus. My Lord said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. No matter how impossible it looks. Yes. No matter how naughty that child is. And I give many people a solution to correct them. Yes. They come back and tell my brother Bruce, that thing work. Best I announce it. Instead of brutalizing a child and beating him with a broomstick huh? and all these kinds of nonsense, huh? they say, I don't know what to do with that child. That child would not listen to me. I say, what do you mean? Huh? They say, I will tell him something, not to do that, not to do that, not to do that. And he continues to do it. He will stop for a moment and go and do it. I say, and what do you do? They say, well, I keep bored and hold it. That's a woman tradition, you know. They say, my throat hurting me. Sometimes I get so vexed, I say, I'll kill you. I'll break your arm. Yeah, they get nervous. Children could run you up a tree, but Thank God for those who don't have. And thank God for the gospel to teach you how to control your children. This remedy always works. Now, so when he is doing his badness, make sure that he understands what you are telling him. Don't do that. I say, make sure he understands. Give him an next one. Huh? Don't do that. All right. Uh, take your little strap, put it behind your back, and make him think that you forget him. That you forget that. Come from a certain area and cross one lash on his back. He will get stupid and what the cat is. I say, okay, don't answer, don't say one word again. Don't beat him with a stick. That's what the Bible tells you to do. Spare not the rod and spoil the child. But some spray the rod and open their mouth and bray like a donkey hole. You are not following Bible principles. See the delinquency. That happened in the school when they removed the rock. That they're now considering bringing it back. They know better than God. You can't know better than God. Uh, no. I say if he does it again, you will build up a complex on him. Don't say nothing again. Stop brain. Because he is getting trained that after you ball so much, then to obey. I say, pass around again and hit him one shot, not more than one, just one. He'll get stupid. They come over to the office, Brother Bruce, that worked like a magic. 
Every time he's doing it wrong, he's looking around. <laughs> now he built up a complex that he might get another shot in his back. Some other children, they're so stubborn. You might have to give them a little more. But I tell you that that work, I'm not telling you to brutalize your child. No. <clears throat> but stop using your mouth in such a foolish way. Uh, yeah. You bypass the Bible and you want to bury like a mule behind that child and the child get a certain training to only obey when you carry your voice up in the air. So it's a psychological effect, right, that he's working on. He knows when he's going to get a whipping, you know. He's going to make you talk at least 10 times, if not 100 times. Yeah. So he built up a complex. By the time you talk again, he knows what is coming after the talking. Mm, yes. All right. So, the salvation. If you will believe the simple gospel of our Lord, the devil would not be provoking you day and night. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Now, the devil comes huh, until you are lost. You made that mistake, you are lost. You have to go and, and, and repent for it. Anytime you start obeying the devil, he will provoke you from now until you die. Satan will pick up things that happen for years. And as you grow older and your mind become a little weaker, the devil will provoke you with that. And say, so you remember what you did 10 years ago? You did not repent for it properly. You better go and repent. From the time you start going to repent on that voice that is speaking to you, you will repent to the whole church. And you will get no relief. You have to believe the word, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse you from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you make that confession about that sin, close it off. You don't go and start digging up patches. Huh? Digging up old sins. The devil will run you to a madhouse. But you ain't going there at all. Because you're going out with a different understanding of the gospel. Anytime the devil come telling you you and save yet, blow it back in his face. Yes, I believe that Jesus is my savior. And he saved me. Yes, and I am going on with God. Amen. All right. This simple gospel that um, was sent out to save people saved millions throughout the seven church age. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for your sins. They had nothing more to preach in the Middle Ages. That's all the gospel they had. It saved millions. All right, I'm watching the time there, Jack. Yeah, he has a marvelous testimony of the thief on the cross. You will understand. The thief on the cross. God demonstrating this power of salvation by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He demonstrated it on the cross before he sent his disciples. And I love this story. I appreciate until there were two thieves on the cross. One was going to reject Christ. 
because of his pride, because of his unbelief, yes, because of his sin, and not accepting salvation through the Savior. Let us count he off, he went down to hell. This is the choice demonstrated on the cross here now, you know. The same gospel that he told his apostles to go and preach. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believe it and baptized shall be saved. And he that believe it not shall be damned. All right, this father did not believe the gospel. Although he heard the gospel. Yeah, he heard the gospel. Yes, but did not believe. He saved the word the Messiah. Take us down. Unbelief speaking. But here, the simplicity of the gospel, little children, don't you think that something is wrong with you? Oh, no, you got baptized, you did one or two little wrong things, you get the flog in. Don't do it again. You ain't going to hell for that. But here, the next fellow who believed, and when he believed, he was the good thief. With all the sins that he done, he was a good thief. You know why this thief was a good thief? Because he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And believing is to be saved. Uh, yeah. Now Lord is a special salvation. He did not get baptized. Lord spare him the baptism because he could not come down. But if he had the chance, he will come down and get baptized. Amen. Salvation is the manifestation of your belief. Yes. It shows that you believe. Yes. If you say you believe the gospel and don't want to be baptized, you're lying. Right. And here the thief on the cross, he believed. Yes, and while Jesus was being crucified, he rebuked the other thief. And they say, you, you yourself know that this man never did nothing. They were following the gospel. But God sometimes have to nail you on a cross to cause you to manifest your belief. And yeah. And when he got nailed on the cross, now he knew in his conscience from hearing the gospel that that man is innocent. And he told the other thief, you say, why you behave like that? Why you talk like that? Knowing that we are guilty, and this man is innocent. Now, this man on the cross, Brother Jackson, believed on the Lord Jesus. And the believing of the Lord Jesus Christ give him salvation. Not just the words that he spoke, because he was telling the thief who this man was. He was the innocent lamb. Yeah, he was hanging around the gospel, but never gave his life to the gospel until God put him on the cross. Yes, now he heard the sweet words that proceeded out of this believing mouth. Remember me, Lord. Remember me, Lord. It was his Lord when thou comest into thy kingdom. How he knew about a kingdom. The man was a believer before, a borderline believer, a thief hearing the gospel in the back, and ashamed to come up to the front. But he believed, and God allowed him to be caught. Thiefing was a terrible thing. Yes. They kill you for it. Roman punishment was bitter. Yeah, that crucifixion was one of the greatest suffering a man could ever suffer to die. They call it the cruel cross. Naked. Publicity, shame, disgrace. Agony, nails on the hand and feet. Yeah. Inhuman punishment. And the thief, <laughs> oh God, I'll die with this story if I have to die. Yeah, 
Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And hear the words of uh, uh, so gracious, words of mercy, words of salvation, words to be saved, words to a sinner, unfit even for hell. And hear the gracious words of our Lord, do you hear it a thousand times? Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. No repentance prayer. You know this? We didn't say bow your head and close your eyes. Oh God, just the lips of mercy. And just a believing heart. What saved him? He believed in the Son of God. And confess that <clears throat> by saying, remember me. That's all. That's all you have to say. You want to be saved as a little child? Huh? You was not baptized. Say, Lord, remember me. Are you here as a sinner this morning yes, who don't know the Lord? Just say in your heart, Lord, remember me. You know where that led that man? To have one of the greatest honors of the Savior carrying the sinner, repentant sinner, down to heaven. He was to go down to paradise shortly. So he could not say he carried him to heaven. He had a business down in paradise. Yes, the home of the bliss. And he took him down there on that journey. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. The home of the bliss. That is where the Old Testament saints used to go. So he went in there. And when Jesus called for those Old Testament saints, then he arose with them too. And he went up a little further. That's when our Lord said, lift up ye gates. <clears throat> yes, and be ye lifted up, and let the king of glory come. Who is this king of glory? A great archangel spoke up, the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. I just fought a battle with hell. And I have the power to say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory come in. Yeah. Oh gosh, that thief was sailing through. And he was not baptized. Jesus broke the law for him. He said, believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And God broke the law for the thief because of circumstances. Oh God, I'm going to close with this one, Brother Jack is going to come after you stand up a little. I believe that story <clears throat> will fit in. Brother Jack, I never try to join this message with your testimony. God supernaturally inspired me. Is afterward I realize, I say, but wait. Brother Jack's testimony will fit right here. Uh, yes. Give me a little chance. Wednesday, I, I'll come back. I cannot hurry down something that the Lord say to preach. Maybe I have won a little soul already. Uh, maybe my friend visiting here today, you never knew that God could forgive you for all your sins. 
And I show you only one example, the thief on the cross. He was a thief. And God saved the man. Let me bring one more example of being saved. There was a woman caught red-handed in the act of adultery. I often question, where is the man? You see, he ran away. Go and find him. How you catch this woman alone and bring her? And with stone in your hands, that is what the law do. Because of what you sins you commit, there was a law that said to kill you. When Jesus came, he said not to kill him. Forgive him. Regardless of what he done, I died on the cross for him. Speaking to this generation and the former generation. And this woman, they bring her home. Oh, the Pharisees, righteous Pharisees. Yes, kicking up, fussing, kicking dust. Yeah, pitch her in the front of the Lord. Yes, face down on the ground. They are dusty. She was caught in the very act of adultery law. What? Dost thou say? And bent down and wrote on the ground. And after the big gallivanting, stopped, he raised his head. And look at the woman. This is the Savior. And this is the sinner. Only one. The Savior could save the sinner. The worst thing upon earth, a prostitute, a whore, and the greatest that ever came from heaven, the Savior of our Lord. Amen. And two met face to face, the sinner and the Savior. He was caught in the very act of adultery, O Lord. What dost thou say? The law say, Moses' law say, to stone her to death. They're trying to implicate our law because he had a gospel of mercy. Oh, yes. She's waiting for a big stone on her head. She had the final word. Our Lord had the final word. To just say, well, obey the law of Moses. I guess she had her two hands on her head. Yes, trying to break the stone. When our Lord lifted up his head, the lips of Moses spoke, the lips of forgiveness. Lips of mercy, I don't care what you do in this life. God has forgiven you for your sins. I don't want to know how vile it was, man. A men are more vile than women. I don't care how vile it was. Some of you young girls don't want to be married because you are afraid to confess what you've done. I say it's under the blood of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You have done no wrong. You are innocent before God because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And you are saved. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the lips of mercy and the lips of judgment arose. So let him that is without sin cast the first stone at her. 
and he went back with his head down on the ground. What he was writing, don't ask me. Then he lifted up his head again, and he saw no man save the woman. No matter what you do in this life, have the courage to confess it to your husband if you did not confess. The blood of God's Son cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And he looked out there, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? Nay, Lord. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. Don't do that again. You were born with an evil nature. You could not help yourself. Yes, that old spirit get away in you. You could not wait for a husband. He was going mad with lust. You went and did the wrong thing. Man, you were so greedy. You have a wife. You still had to go after his nakedness. Neither do I condemn it. Let the musician come. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Don't do it again. I have put aside the law of Moses for you today. Mercy has done it. Grace did it. Faith did it. I have put aside the law of Moses to save you today. And those men all had sin. They wanted to gossip. All that wanted to be a tattletale alone. They also had sin. Neither do I. Oh, and sin no more. Isn't that a marvelous saving story of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus? And then when a man turned down that, isn't he fit to be condemned? Isn't he fit to go to hell? And he that believeth not shall be damned. That damnation is blasphemy. It is to go to hell. And it is to burn in a lake of fire. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ, my precious children, Visiting friends around the world, bow your heads, close your eyes. I call a call for this sinner prayer, home and overseas. If some has not laid that foundation yet, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do it right now. Thus, the Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom, I believe you died on the cross to forgive me for all my sins. I accept you. I believe you. I believe I am saved. So help me, Lord Jesus, to live a Christian life for you from this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand. I feel to speak a little bit on Wednesday, you know, concerning the saving power of Jesus.
How he saved you by the same method. You accepted Jesus Christ one day. And it resulted in you being here for years. It was a seed sown. It was a seed sown. Any one of you that fall down and die today, die tomorrow, you are going in like the thief on the cross. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What a marvelous savior that we saw. No matter what happened in your life, he will continue to deal with you and save you. Yes, for his honor and glory. Thank you. Give us for verse day and then Brother Jack will come. Go out if you want to. My father is omnipotent. My father is omnipotent. And that you can.
presence of the Lord. And I want to read a scripture for a foundation of what I would say this evening. You don't have to turn Luke the 23rd chapter and the 32nd verse. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. Two thieves, and a thief in Bible times in the story of the Good Samaritan, they said the man fell among thieves, and they robbed him, and wounded him, and left him for dead. Two bandits. Yes, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hung railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. If thou be Christ, this thief had known about Christ, but he did not want to change his ways. And his attitude showed that he just wanted to come down from the cross to continue with his wickedness. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God? A bandit that fear God. Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. For this man had done nothing amiss. That fear for God led him to respect the Lord and defend the Lord. And it was going to lead him to salvation, as you would see by a dying deathbed confession. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his words, and you may have your seat. Amen. The first person that would be saved after the blood of Christ was shed, a thief and a criminal. Yes, so I read that scripture to give a great testimony concerning a soul that we won to the kingdom of God on his dying bed by the guidance of our shepherd. And I am proud to say that I was a part of this who followed the man of God's instruction. So I am speaking as a personal witness. Now this deals with a young man who was shot and murdered in this village recently. He was buried last Saturday. His name was Devon. And I would give you the facts of the matter as a personal witness and from the testimony of others. So now this shooting took place just up the road from the church, just past the junction just about a few hundred meters away, just before the cemetery, a very gruesome murder. Now, a little background on this young man. He was about 30 years of age when he died, and he was born and grew up in this village 
him and several of his brothers and sisters. Now I don't say this in disregard to his precious mother, who is a most humble and pleasant lady, and who is very thankful for the intervention of the church and sent her thanks to Brother Bruce and the church. But this young man grew up without parental guidance. His mother went away when he was of seven years of age. Maybe she went to work, maybe for betterment, And several of him and his siblings, eight of them, were left in the care of others. He was the second oldest. They would be back and forth in the village, living by a couple homes. And his mother used to send things for them and supported them. And she even sent money and built a home for them. So sometimes people made these sacrifices for betterment. So he grew up without parental guidance. Later on, he disappeared from the village for a long time. And Brother Kwaku, who was neighbor to these young men and knew them from small, said that he learned that he had gone to live in a village called Enterprise. Now, Enterprise is one of the worst and most dangerous places to live in this country. You are talking about criminals, gangs, guns, gang warfare, murders, and reprisal killings. So this young man went to that area to live along with some of his brothers, having no parental guidance. And needless to say, he followed friends, he was not walking right, and there were stories behind his name. So from the reports, he went the wrong way. His brother said in the funeral that he had a terrible temper. But we are not concerned with all those things. What we are concerned with is his soul. But with all of these alleged stigmas, like the thief on the cross, one thing about this young man was that he seemed to have had a little fear for God. And he had some respect for the brethren and respect for this church. Brother Kwaku said, for the years knowing him from a child as the neighbor's son, he was never disrespectful to him. He would never pass Brother Kwaku's home without calling out to him in respect. Good morning, Mr. Philip. Good evening, Mr. Philip. And bow his head and raise his hand as a mark of respect. So too, Sister Kwaku. Good morning, Mom. And always like that, very, very respectful, they not knowing anything to the contrary about his lifestyle. And to further show the respect he had for the brethren, one day he was cussing off a Rango Tango woman in the village. And Sister Kwaku was passing. And he paused and said, wait, wait, wait. The Christian lady is passing. Let her pass. When she has finished pass, I will give you the rest. So he had that much respect for the brethren. And also, he stood in defense of the church. One backslider who was a friend of his told me that once he and Devon were talking about church, and Devon's girlfriend, his fiance, asked the backslider, what do you know about church? And the backslider said, I used to go to church at Bethel. And she replied, oh, the Branhamite church. And the backslider said that Devon spoke out and said, don't say that. Those people have the truth up there. 
if you don't know, don't say. And he stood up for the church. So he seemed to have had a little fear for God and respect for the church, and somehow his mind seemed to have been on the Lord. Maybe he saw the life of some little child in school or something and knew certain things about the church growing up in this neighborhood watching Brother Kwaku's and their life. So he and a few of his brothers had come back to Freeport of recent times and they were staying in the street by where myself, Brother Kwaku, and several of the brethren live. So on this fatal night, Thursday the 10th of May, 2018, he was playing football with other villagers just down the road by the playing field, along with one of my sons, Isaac, who fell away. And when they had finished playing, and he and his brother's brother was walking home, now coming from the football, just up the road, a gunman was hiding by the cemetery wall waiting for them. And when they reached, the gunman emerged with his gun and started shooting at them. The video footage was published. I saw it. It is very gruesome. It seemed to have been a reprisal killing. So his brother, his smaller brother, managed to run and escape with only one bullet hitting him. But when Devon tried to run, he slipped and fell, and the gunman came up upon him and began mercilessly shooting him and pumped seven bullets in him while he was on the ground, rolling and trying to dodge and escape bullets and trying to get up. Very gruesome to look at. So he laid on the side of the road until they got a vehicle to take him to the hospital and he died two weeks later, almost two weeks later on Wednesday, the 23rd of May, 2018. Now about a month before his death, his younger brother told me that this young man had a dream that he was murdered by the very shooter. And not only that, his mother who was in the US told me that she had dreamt that she saw him lying on the side of the road with a three quarter pants and a white vest and he was dead. I would not doubt that this mother was praying for her children. So after they had left the football field, Isaac was still by the playing field and he heard the shots and passing that way in a car, he saw Devon on the roadside bleeding. So Isaac would call me later that night and told me what has happened, had happened, and I called someone who would know and they inquired and called me back and tell me what had happened. Now this is where our shepherd would come in and by his guidance it will lead to the salvation of this young man. <laughs> so Brother Bruce said he and a part of his family were sitting at their table around the time that the shooting took place late that evening, and they heard the gunshots not too far from the church. It alerted them. They had heard many gunshots, and they were all one after the other. And then they wanted to find out what had went on. They heard the shots and knew that the police had came, but they did not know what had went on. So I know in what had happened, I WhatsApp Burbus and told him, and Burbus said immediately, his heart went out for the young man. So I didn't know if eventually he had died or if he was still alive. But on the following day, 11th of May, I was speaking with Brother Bruce by WhatsApp, and I said, I wonder if those fellas are dead. I said, I guess so. And Brother Bruce said he would like to find out what happened to them. He said, we think of their souls. So I inquired from Brother Kwaku's son, and they said that two of them are in the hospital, one in ICU and the other in the hospital. 
And I told Barabus, and Barabus said, may those people repent before they pass on. So two days later, Brother Bruce WhatsApp me again on the 13th of May, and he said, anything new on the persons who got shot? Any of them died? Isaac will know of him. That is his partner. So I contacted Isaac, and he told me that the two fellows were alive, and I told Brother Bruce, and he said, that is good. I hope they repent. So now days are passing, and nine days after the shooting, on the 19th of May, Brother Bruce found out some relevant information about the condition of the young man and that he was in ICU. And he said from the time he heard of the condition of the young man and that he was in ICU, he said, God could save the thief on the cross. And desperation set in in his heart. So I got up after 10 that night and I saw a WhatsApp from Burbus which said, Brother Jack, a little thing crossed my mind and that is, I found out about the status of this boy that got shot. I understand that he is still in ICU and he is badly off. So through Isaac, if you could reach there somehow, we could lead that boy to the Lord. So we have a good excuse because it is Isaac's friend. So if it is possible and you could go there, you just say a prayer. See if he will accept it. Remember the thief on the cross. See if you could lead the thief to the cross. Isaac could tell him I brought my daddy to pray for you. He either accept or don't accept. Maybe he will accept. Or tell him you are from the village there and you heard of this incident and you came to pray for him. Give it a try. Anything you could do. The devil will block that. I heard he is badly off and he is in ICU. It's worth a try after a soul. Or even if you could get a phone number and call him, just do your best. So the next morning, Sunday the 20th of May, I contacted Isaac and went and picked him up. And we went up in the north of the island to a hospital during visiting hours to try to find the young man. They sent us upstairs, back downstairs, and we couldn't find him. So Isaac made a call and we learned that he was in the hospital in the south of the island. And Isaac told me that they had amputated one of his legs. So I called Barabus, I said we could go down in the evening visiting hours. But Barabus said, maybe if you have the time tomorrow evening, because it doesn't seem like he is dying really. He said, for all you know, being that he is not dying, he may not be ready to accept the Lord. Come home. And he told me in church that evening, that boy has been on his mind. So on the morrow, which was Monday the 21st of May, I called Isaac and did not get on to him. So I went down by myself. So I was early. And afterwards, a number of his siblings, relatives, stepfather, friends came, including his brother that was shot with him. And the nurses were only letting in two persons in ICU ward at a time. It was there that I would learn that it was seven bullets he had gotten. His smaller brother knew me and told a friend, this is Isaac's father. So I told those who were gathered there that the pastor of Bethel had this young boy on his mind and he wanted somebody to come and pray for him and I have come to do so. And it seemed to have touched them. So the nurses were only allowing two persons in at a time to see him. So everybody else took their turn going in. His fiance would remain in the room right through, and one other person would go in and meet her one after the next. And it came down to only two people left outside, me and the other brother who was shot. And visiting hour was finishing. 
And the young woman came out and she said only one more person could come in. So the younger brother went in and I told her, I came to pray for him and if you tell the nurses that, they may allow me in. And his fiancée went in and I don't know what conversation they had, but she came back out and she stayed outside and she let me go in and take a place. If you see the condition of this man, seven bullets, one leg broken by bullet, the other leg that got bullet, got gangrene, they cut it off. Bullet in two arms, swell, oxygen mass over mouth and nose. And if you see the condition of this young man, real distress as I read, I tell you that was a sight. And his brother told him, this is Isaac's father, he has come to pray for you. So I told him, I am Isaac, Father, and I have come to pray for you. You could have died. God spared your life for a reason. I wasn't sure if he was understanding me. He would look at me. So I asked his brother, is he understanding me? His brother said, yes. So I asked him, would you want me to pray for you? He said, yes. I said, repeat this prayer after me. And I bowed my head and made him repeat a sinner's prayer. And we had one this mass over his face and my eyes are closed. I am not hearing him too well. And then I said, repeat. I now accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. And I opened my eyes. He said, Amen. He was following me. I said, No, I will pray for you. And I prayed for him. And I went outside and told his girlfriend that I had prayed for him. And she smiled and went back inside. Now, the day after, which was Tuesday, the 22nd of May, when his family went to see him, they were surprised to see the young man had improved and was sitting up in bed and was in good spirit. One of his brothers told Brother Kwaku, he said they were surprised to see that he was sitting up in bed and they had removed all the instruments from him. And he was talking, the doctor said he was good and he was talking and laughing with them. And he told his brother there who was shot with him that he loved him. And he said, you all don't know what pain I am going through. And he told his little brother, don't you follow or do like me. Be a good boy. And he told the different ones there that he loved them. And the little brother told me, he said, he was asking if there was a better place for him. And he said, I thought he was talking about the hospital, but it looked like he was talking about something else. So he was so up in his spirit, and they went home and left him there Tuesday afternoon, 5.30 after visiting hours. Only to hear on the following morning, he succumbed to his injuries and went on. Went on with the Lord. So when the news of his death came to me, I called Brother Bruce and told him, he said, we have won a soul in the kingdom of God. We have won a soul in the kingdom of God. I praise the living God for your urgency. God bless that soul he entered, and I tell you, that's a victory. Thank God. God saved the thief on the cross. So the funeral was held on last Saturday, the 26th. And I WhatsApp Brother Bruce and told him, and he told me to extend his condolences to the mother and to give condolences on behalf of the church. So a few of the saints who knew him went down with me, and we went to the funeral, funeral and there was gathered about 100 people 
mother, stepfather, brothers, sisters, villagers, maybe some of his bad friends. And very few of them knew that I had led him to Christ. So when it came into my heart to go up and speak to the people, and coming down to the end, the Lord made a way. And I went up in wisdom and introduced myself from Bethel Church and told them that I bring condolences from the pastor of Bethel, Brother Bruce, on behalf of the church. And I said if different ones would have to speak concerning this young man, some would say good and some would say bad about him. I said, but I have had one encounter with this young man, and I want to say something in great commendation of this young man. I said, when Jesus was dying, there were two thieves on the cross. They had stolen all the days of their life. And because of that, nothing good could be said about them. I said, but one of the thieves in his dying moment said, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And I said, though nothing good could be said about that thief, I could say one thing in commendation of that thief that he acknowledged the Lord on the cross. And I told him the story of my shepherd's concern for this young man and how he sent me to pray for him, and that he repeated a sinner's prayer and accepted the Lord as his Savior on his deathbed. And I said I could say this in commendation of this young man, and I believe he is in glory today. I said, and this offer is available to all. I met the mother at the funeral, a very pleasant and humble lady. She seemed to be conscious of salvation, because when her brother told her what had transpired at the hospital and that her son was asked if he would accept the Lord as his Savior, she asked, did he accept it? And when she was told, yes, she was happy and thankful. And by another brother, she sent thanks to Brother Bruce and the church was sending someone to lead her son to the Lord and said that she is very confident that her son made it in and she is happy that he accepted the Lord as his Savior. It was a gruesome murder, but some good came out of it. We won a soul to the Lord. It sent a message to the villagers here that this church is concerned. And I believe a seed has been sown to save other members of that family and even other people in this village. And closing remarks. When I was in the hospital waiting to see the young man, I WhatsApp Burbus and told him I was waiting to go in to see him. And he WhatsApped me back and said, Okay, brother Jacko, you are a man of business. Where a soul is concerned, we have to be good businessmen. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Business, profit, and loss. And when it was all over, he said, all the glory goes to the Lord. He said, I thank God for the nod of the Spirit, and we must obey the little nod of the Spirit. Not only that, but recognize it. He said, sometimes it comes and we brush it away, and the Lord does not like that. We must quiet ourselves and be in the Spirit and looking up to the Lord that we can feel the nod of the Spirit to do or don't do. So I want to say as we all stand that we want to give all the praise and honor and glory for what the Lord has done in saving a soul. Calvary, the first person to ever be saved after the shedding of the blood, a thief and a criminal. God doing that to show what his sacrifice accomplished on mankind, for sinful mankind, and showing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, that a thief that stole all the days of his life and lived no matter what sinful life, if he would reach out to the Lord in humble repentance, God could, could forgive him for all his sins and save him. So let us bow our heads and close our eyes. And Lord, with hearts joined together, 
We want to return all the thanks and all the praises and all the honor and all the glory for leading thy servant so that his soul might be saved. Lord, bless us. Go with us as we go for a short intermission. Bring us back. In Jesus Christ's name we pray for your honor and glory. Amen. 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 You may have a seat.